Great, thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for inviting me for uh, this presentation on the Commission on Genetic Resources for uh, Food and Agriculture. I will um, briefly introduce the Commission, what it does, its objectives, how it works, uh, summarize some of the activities of the Commission related to plant genetic resources, and then uh, also been asked to address some of the uh, outcomes of the recent 18th regular session of the commission. And uh, I will end my presentation by sort of providing also some uh, ideas on how stakeholders can contribute to the work of the commission if they so wish. The commission was established in 1983 Originally, as the Commission on Plant Genetic Resources, it is a statutory body um, of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Uh, uh, a few years later, in 1999, I decided to broaden the Commission's mandate to cover all components of biodiversity for food agriculture. So since then, the Commission does not only deal with plant genetic resources, it deals with animal, forest, aquatic, and also microorganism and vertebrate genetic resources. The Commission is an intergovernmental uh, body uh, that specifically deals uh, with biodiversity for food and agriculture. And in that regard, it is in fact quite unique. You may have heard of the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources, which is scope limited to plant genetic resources, or the Convention on Biological Diversity, which deals with all biodiversity for food and agriculture. So the Commission's mandate really focuses on biodiversity for food and agriculture. The Commission currently has 178 uh, member nations as members, and the European Union is also a member, and it meets uh, every two years. So basically, the Commission uh, is an uh, intergovernmental body that aims to reach international consensus on, on policies on the sustainable use and conservation of genetic resources, and it offers a, a platform for its members and other stakeholders to consider joint action on all matters related to biodiversity for food and agriculture. The Commission's vision is to conserve and manage biodiversity for food and agriculture in support of, of global food security and sustainable development for now and for the, for the future, and has adopted four goals, sustainable use, conservation, but also access to genetic resources for food and agriculture, which obviously is essential, and not less essential, the sharing of benefits derived from the utilization of genetic resources. And a fourth goal is the full participation of all relevant stakeholders in decision-making processes regarding genetic sources. And as you can see on the slide, these goals are also reflected in the sustainable development goals. The Commission, uh, as I said, since 1995 deals with all genetic resources for food and agriculture, plant genetic sources, animal, forest, aquatic, microorganism, genetic sources, but it also deals with biodiversity for food and agriculture. And that includes all these different components of genetic resources for food and agriculture, but it also includes biodiversity that does not end up on our plates. That's the biodiversity that is nonetheless essential for our food production, for example, pollinators or soil microorganisms. The Commission also deals with crop sectoral matters. And these are matters relate, relevant to several uh, or all components of biodiversity, food and agriculture, such as climate change or food security or access and benefit mm. sharing. The Commission provides an important forum for discussing these issues, and it allows the different sectors of genetic resources, which often work very much in, in isolation from each other, in silos, to discuss these matters with each other and to identify similarities and differences for the different sectors, and also to identify possibilities to collaborate on these matters. Now, how does the Commission approach uh, the different sectors of genetic resources for food and agriculture? The Commission's work cycle usually starts with country reporting. So with an assessment of the status and trends of specific genetic resources in all the different countries. So countries report to FAO on the status of conservation of the specific genetic resources. 
They report on their use. They report on the drivers of change affecting the genetic resources. They report on challenges and opportunities involved in conservation and in the conservation and use of uh, genetic resources. In a second step, the FAO compiles and analyzes all these different country reports and produces, under the Commission's guidance, a whole state of the world report, which is a global country driven assessment. And these assessments are important simply to know where we stand, but they're also important for countries and for raising public awareness of the importance of genetic resources. Now, so far, there are two global assessments on plants, two on animals, and there is one global assessment for each of the sectors of aquatic and forest genetic resources and for biodiversity for food and agriculture. And for plant genetic resources and forest genetic resources, there are currently new global assessments under preparation. On the basis of the global assessments, the Commission will usually consider in a third step, policy responses. And these are measures the Commission members commit to implement to address gaps and shortcomings of the conservation activities or to address the drivers of genetic erosion and, and biodiversity loss. And these policy responses include global action plans, such action plans exist for plant, for animal, and for forest genetic resources. And we do hope that in December, the Council will adopt a global action plan, which was negotiated by the Commission on aquatic genetic resources, and that it will also endorse a framework on biodiversity for food and agriculture. Once the policy responses have been agreed and, if appropriate, adopted by the conference or the Council of FAO, the most important part of the Commission's work cycle is the implementation. And it is the most important, and let's be frank, it's also the most difficult uh, part and probably the part with biggest problems because many countries lack the capacity and the resources to implement the global plans of action. Now, FAO assists countries to the extent possible in the implementation of the global action plans, but we also assist through technical guidelines, standards, which countries may use in the implementation of the action plans. So for example, FAO adopted gene bank standards that help gene bank managers to uh, conserve plant genetic resources in gene banks, but also guidelines, for example, for the conservation and sustainable use of farmers varieties and land races, which have been developed by FAO also under the guidance of the commission. Now, in a final step, countries have agreed to monitor the implementation of these policy responses and action plans and to report back to the Commission. And for animals and plant genetic resources, the Commission has established an online reporting tool with views and data. And for aquatic and forest genetic resources, the online reporting tools are currently under development. And this is basically where things come full circle because the monitoring results, of course, feed into country reports, which then form the basis for the next global assessment. So this is the Commission's work cycle. Of particular importance for the Commission, for the work of the Commission are its subsidiary bodies. The Commission has intergovernmental technical working groups, which meet in between the sessions of the Commission and these working groups are in forest, on plants, on animal and aquatic genetic resources. And they play a key role in the Commission's work and the preparation of the global assessments, also in the preparation of the policy instruments, the global plans of action, and so forth. The Commission is also supported by a group of national focal points and biodiversity for food and agriculture, and by a team of technical and legal experts on access and benefit sharing. And all these groups meet in between the sessions of the Commission to provide advice and guidance to the Commission. A key role in the Commission's work also play national focal points, and these are individuals that are nominated by governments to 
collaborate in a rather informal way with the Commission Secretariat with FAO. And the national focal points play a role in the uh, preparation of State of the World reports, of country reports, and then of the State of the World reports. And they play obviously also an important role in the implementation of the policy responses. They are also responsible for liaising with stakeholders at national level. And the Commission Secretariat encourages very much national four points to actually also gather data from stakeholders, from national stakeholders, to liaise with national stakeholders in the preparation of country reports. And we encourage stakeholders also to get in contact with national focal points of the Commission. And national focal points exist for all the different sectors of genetic resources, so for plant, animal, aquatic, forest, genetic resources. And they also exist for the biodiversity for food and agriculture. And they're all listed on the website that is given on the slide, uh, including with the addresses and contact details, et cetera. Now, a few remarks on the Commission's work on plant genetic resources, which I understand is this audience of particular relevance. Plant genetic resources are any genetic material of plant origin of agro or potential value for food and agriculture, which is the definition of CBD and so in the plant treaty. And they include, of course, farmers' varieties, land traces, improved varieties, crop wild relatives, wild food plants, but also research materials. PGRV are, are critical for achieving and maintaining global food security and nutrition. About 82% of our daily energy intake comes from plants. Half of that comes from only three crops. Uh, which are they? Well, I guess you, you, you probably know, know better than, than I. Uh, it's maize, wheat, and rice. PGRA are just a, a fraction of the total entire pool of, of plant species. That over 6,000, about 6,000 species have been cultivated or are being cultivated. Uh, for fewer than 200 species, we actually have global uh, statistics uh, for the production levels. And then in the beginning, the Commission started off as a Commission on Plant Genetic Resources. It was established in 1983. And when it was established, the international undertaking on plant genetic resources was adopted by FAO. And this was an undertaking that basically stated that plant genetic resources are a heritage of mankind. Now, in the follow up to the adoption of the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Commission revised the undertaking, and the outcome was that the international undertaking became the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources, which, as you probably all know, nowadays very clearly states that countries, states, have sovereign rights over their, their own plant genetic resources for food and agriculture. And uh, what I should mention is that, of course, nowadays, even though the Commission negotiated the treaty, the treaty and the Commission are two separate entities. The Commission and the treaty have their own secretariats, their own governing bodies. Treaty has its own budget, its own decision-making processes. But originally, the treaty was once negotiated by the Commission. Now, further milestones of the Commission's one PGRFA include the reports on the state of the world's PGRFA, the first one published in 1996, the second in 2009, the third is currently in preparation, and of course, the adoption of global action plans on plant genetic resources first adopted in 1996 and the second GPA adopted in 2011. And we'll see whether it will be revised in response to the third report on the state of the world's PR. Now, the second global plan of action, which was adopted in 2011, is a not a legally binding document. It's voluntary in nature. But it nonetheless uh, expresses the, the commitment of governments to the conservation and sustainable use of plant genetic resources. Governments committed to undertake 18 different priority activities in the areas of in situ conservation and management, ex situ conservation, sustainable use, and uh, capacity development. And countries also committed themselves to monitor and report back to FAO on the implementation of the second GA. In 2013, the Commission also adopted targets with the timeline of the CBD IEG targets 2020 for the conservation of sustained use and for capacity development. And the Commission agreed also on 58 indicators against which national focal points 
report on the implementation of the second PA. And in fact, some of these indicators are now also being used. Some of you might know that by at least to report on the implementation of the SDG target 2.4. And I guess Francois will talk more about those targets and indicators, so I will not go into any detail at this stage. Let me mention briefly some of the outcomes of the Commission's last session uh, with particular relevance to plant generic resources. The Commission um, took note of practical guides which have been prepared in the course of uh, lengthy uh, informal consultations. These practical guides are, um, serve uh, the, uh, gene managers in the application, should assist gene bank managers in the application of the gene bank standards. And the Commission requested that these practical guides be published. The Commission also discussed uh, the results of a symposium on in situ conservation and on farm management of plant genetic resources, and it proposed that such symposia should be held uh, more regularly in the future. The Commission called for more research on the impact of seed policies, laws, and regulations, taking into account the variety of factors that may affect farmers' ability to access sufficient and, and affordable uh, seeds and plant materials of, of uh, locally, locally adapted and, and, uh, and uh, diverse um, farmers' varieties. And we also discussed the preparation of the third report, of course. Um, the deadline for the submission of country reports is the 31st of December. So that is something to recall. Many countries uh, will come late, we uh, assume, but there may still be an opportunity for uh, stakeholders to talk to national focal points and to make sure that country reports reflect the actual situation of the conservation and sustainable use of PGRFA in their countries. And of course, the Commission discussed access and benefit check, also digital sequence information, highly controversial topics uh, on which we have not really reached any conclusion yet. Now, before drawing to an end, uh, how can you, how can any state contribute or, or influence the work of the Commission? Now, the second GPA is obviously mainly addressed at governments but its implementation is obviously impossible without the full uh, participation of all stakeholders involved. NGOs and, and civil society organizations may also attend the, the meetings of the commission and sessions of the, the working groups of the commission as observers. And they may uh, make uh, written submissions, the commission secretariat, from time to time calls for written submissions by stakeholders as well as governments. And th these uh, statements are, uh, these requests by the commission are usually circulated very widely. And obviously uh, stakeholders may collaborate with national focal points in reporting on the implementation of the second global plan of action and also in reporting for the third report. And if you want to keep yourself abreast of of the developments at the Commission, you may also wish to subscribe our newsletter. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan.